We love hub. Welcome back, everyone, and I hope you're ready for this episode because we are going to be discussing sex today. Not just how to do it and when to do it, but actually how to own your sexual desire, your body, your sexual identity, and ultimately your intimate relationships. And to guide us down this very enlightening path is our guest today, Liz Elgin Fritz, who is a holistic sex educator. So, look, there's a lot we need to talk about here. So let's get started. Welcome to Be Love Hub, Liz. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It is a pleasure to be here with you, ladies. Great. So first question off, I mean, it's in everyone's wondering, what is a holistic sex educator? Okay. Well, I'm glad you asked. (laughs) And I guess I, I would say there's basically six principles to holistic sexuality education. And the first one is that... Our sexuality is an integral part of who we are as human beings, right? And and if I use the the yogic model, which is my background where I come from, to look at that, it's, you know, and it's, this. we're on video, so I can show you actually brought this and it's on my website. You can, you can, you can look at it. This is, you know, the circle that represents who we are as human beings. And, you know, we're, there are layers, sort of like Russian nesting dolls to our, our, essence of as a human and you know there's our physical body there's our energy body there's our mental body our wisdom body and the core of who we are is our truest truest purest essence and if you think about sexuality it really covers all of those layers of our being you know right down to you know probably excluding the core or maybe it's maybe it's entirely the core of our being is is you know an expression of our sexuality as well but you know our physical body our emotions, the physiology of what moves through our body, our sexual response, that's the, that's the energy layer, how we, what we think about our bodies, um, how we think about ourselves as a, as a sexual being, that's the mental body. And then we get deeper and deeper, we start to connect with, and I would say own, which I'm so glad, Judy, you said that at the very beginning, the truth of our inner experience. So that's sort of the first principle. And, and we can, I can move on from there. The second one is that, um, it's such a delicious one. Pleasure is healing, right? Pleasure is healing. And there's a lot to say about that. And there's a lot in sort of out there about pleasure right now. But I think at its core, if I just say that and you think about it and you feel that in your body, you're like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. On every level, whether it's going out and having the sun on your skin or, drinking your favorite cup of coffee in the morning or smelling your favorite essence or having incredible sex with your lover, you know, it's healing. It takes us to another level beyond which we would normally experience in our everyday lives. And then the the third one is that who we are as human beings is also interconnected to a wider spectrum and a web of life, right? There's our families, there's our, our, our culture, there's government, like, hello, right now, today, like, we're not going to spend the whole session talking about Roe v. Wade, are we? But here we go. It's a perfect example. Um, you know, there's our socioeconomic status, all of those things both affect and, and, and are affected by, in turn, our sexuality. And what else can I say about it? Oh, yes, of course. This is a great one. Um, Gender orientation, sexual orientation, and relationship styles are all evolving constructs that evolve perhaps over a person's lifetime and also over time in our culture, in our society, in our government, etc. All of those domains in which we, we exist, in which we are a part of. They're not static things, right? We're seeing this right now with the gender revolution that that were that were um, is out there with pronouns and different types of sexual orientation terminologies and things that, quite frankly, amongst many people in our age bracket, is confusing. <laughs> our our age bracket and above is confusing as hell. And then the last two are that holistic sex education belong begins with the the educator, right? So what that really means is. I have to really look at myself in the same way and be so that I can be in touch with that within myself so that I can approach my, my clients, my students um, with that understanding. And then, of course, because we're talking about all the interconnectedness of things in life and how that expresses sexually and, and how sexuality is expressed, 
These are all dynamic things that set holistic sexuality education itself is evolving, right? And what we know, what we think, and what we, these are not static things. Like I'm not going to come and say, this is how it is. It's sort of like, this is how it is today in the world as we know it and how we feel it, it works. It's working right now. That's it. So that's a pretty well, that, robust that's, that's actually. That's not that easy. That's a lot of information and a lot of a lot of layers on something someone might say for sex. It's which is like the most primal act you can think of. So it's much more than just sex, clearly. So you're getting to yeah. some place other than just that primal act of having sex, right? Right, right. And isn't okay. it I don't know if I would I was gonna say, isn't isn't it a relief to like put some some context and some some layers around things that we in a, in a time that we tend to just way oversimplify everything, you know, with our little text bites and our Twitters and our tweets, you know, it's like, nope, it is not that simple. You know, these things are complex and we need ways of looking at these things that are complex to truly understand ourselves. Yeah, right. Because I'm just, we're also used to looking at it as black or white. And now it's just, there's just so many mixed into the, into the whole process. Yeah. Well, how we were raised and how we were educated and in our era, in our time, in our country, in our culture, in our government, we were fed a very particular narrative. And we're at a place in time where that's being exploded, right? It's, 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 there's a revolution going out there between the information available, the ways in which information is available, the freedom of expression. Um, up until a couple of days ago, the freedom of you know our choice is is on is is prevalent. So it's all evolving. We're right at that time. What kind of training did you have to go on, go through in order to become a holistic sex educator? So there's a few different um, places you can go. I mean, I'm a member of ASECT, which is the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists. And so there's a certification that you can obtain through that organization. And it requires you know, training from a couple of different certified places and a lot of supervision and things like that. And so my training was through the Institute for Sexuality Education and Enlightenment, otherwise known as IC. And how long how long does it take to get certified? It really depends on how much time you you put into it. There's a certain number of hours that you have to take uh, you know, for classes and it, it can you can do it in a year, you can do it in two years. and then there's work that you have to do. Um, you have to log in that time working with people and under supervision and have a certain number of hours of supervision. so it's 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 sort of self-paced in that regard. Um, but of course, I also started my training. I'm sure we'll get to this, but you know, through, through the yoga process, um, through the yoga modalities earlier, and focusing on yoga for the pelvis and doing training in that area, which really started the whole process for myself before this training. Well, why don't you tell us? Actually, we'll back up and we'll get to yoga for the pelvis because I want to know more about that. But you've also had many different careers, several different careers. And so tell us about your life a little bit and how you ended up in this place as a sex educator. Oh my goodness. Oh gosh, how far back do I go? <laughs> well, I guess for, I'll just start professionally. I mean, you know, I grew up in the eighties and like a lot of people were like, what are you going to do? Well, I don't know. I gotta make money. <laughs> it was all about making money. Right. So I went to business school. Went to business school at NYU and I ended up, you know, getting recruited onto Wall Street and working there for several years. At which point I was like, ooh, I cannot live a life where what I do really just is not making an impact on this world. I just I always felt that call. I moved to Asia for a couple of years. I spent a few years traveling around Southeast Asia importing furniture from Indonesia back to the US. Um, I sort of explore, explored that whole like creativity piece and and just aesthetic, which really appealed to me. And then I created after that a chain of juice bars. Um, so over the course of a decade, I began and grew and ultimately sold a chain of juice bars called Elixir that really sprung out of, you know, it was sort of the beginning of my really wanting to make a difference for people from a health, wellness, and well-being, community, authenticity, these different layers that I brought into that, that kind of work with the business that I created. 
Um, and that's a hard business to run, you know, especially when you have three kids and ended up for me being, you know, ultimately four kids um, and you have a bunch of stores and a bunch of employees. And I, I really, really ran myself ragged. And it's, it was sort of the beginning of the foundation of like why the holistic sexuality education approach really you know, made sense to me and really resonated with me because you know, we have so many things that are being fed to us all the time as women that we think we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be the best mom. We're supposed to be that entrepreneur. We're supposed to have all of this stuff. And by the way, be beautiful and awesome and sexy and all of these things. And I was like, yes, 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 I can do all of this. Meanwhile, I'm going crazy inside, you know, and I became, I was a nervous wreck. And that's how I, you know, ultimately became a yoga teacher after I, um, after I sold, sold my company, I just got deeper and deeper into my practice with self-healing and my teachers, Rodney uh, Yee and Colleen Sabini were like, okay, you need to take the teacher training, Liz. And then like, you have a gift and you have to keep going. And I did advanced certifications with them. And I became also an urban Zen integrative therapist, which um, adds layers of um, restorative yoga, Reiki, essential oils, and embodied meditations to work on, in short, the nervous system, really, and, and, and healing through through those modalities. And I use a lot of those in my work with clients right now, a lot of that work. Um, and, um, and then, I, you know, ultimately, one of, the, one of their colleagues came and did a training on the pelvis, and I was like, yes, because it was always the part of the body that I was very curious about. I've had a lot of injuries around my pelvis just through being a lifelong athlete and having injuries and falls and birthing four children and things like that. Um, little things like that. <laughs> and, um, and I just realized like, wow, in all of my teachings and mentoring, all the students that I mentored in teacher trainings, I realized it's such a blind spot for people. And it's so hard to talk about in class, you know, because of the, there's just, sex and the shame and just, you know, you, you can't touch it. You can't talk about it. Um, things coming in, things going out of <laughs> the pelvis. It's just like, you know, hard to do. So I really dove deep into that and um, began working exclusively with women, teaching um, yoga for the pelvis workshops and uh, pelvic floor uh, work and working with women with pelvic floor dysfunction and, um, and then, which ultimately led to this, because it, it, those issues are inextricably related to sexuality. Yeah. So explain mm -hmm. yoga for the pelvis a little bit. So, I mean, really, it's using the tools of yoga to focus specifically on the areas of the pelvis, just being able really to deep dive in there, having, helping women understand what their, you know, where their pelvis is, how it's supposed to be oriented to be, you know, in its most natural essence, what is a healthy pelvis? Um, starting with connecting with it, right? Starting with acknowledging that it is there, it, it, you know, understanding what the state of it is. For a lot of women who have experienced difficulties, it doesn't, it's very, it feels very much like not a safe place to even be. So we end up not breathing into that space. We end up breathing up here and then completely disconnecting from the lower parts of our body. And then we end up with pelvic floor dysfunction. It's one of the reasons we can end up with pelvic floor dysfunction and, and all other kinds of problems, digestive issues, reproductive issues. And um, anyway, so really I, I work with, there's a lot of breath work. Let me say that. There's a lot of breath work and understanding because um, the breath tells you a lot. Because that, the breath is the, is the conduit to the energy body. So we can look at the physical body and how we're standing, where we're strong, where we're weak, how we're holding our body. And then there's how the breath moves through the body that helps us go to the deeper level of the energy body. Restorative yoga helps us get to a deeper level of the energy body. Um, and then... Is, it, yeah. is there a physical exercise that um you teach as yeah, well so i'll say like, primarily in, in the earlier stages of working with yoga for the pelvis explicitly and, and really how if i'm just specifically working with a client on on issues and using yoga for that women that people can tend to fall into two categories 
hypotonic and hypertonic. And pelvic floor physical therapists, I'm sure you've had some on this program, or if not, I'm going to give you some recommendations and you can bring some really amazing women on. Um, you know, they're physical therapists who work with women specifically about, you know, issues that come up. And so hypotonic would mean the muscles of the pelvic floor are weak. And hypertonic would mean there's too much tension. So you might, you might say having a hypotonic pelvic floor is like having a hand that can't close. Having, you can't make a fist. Having hypertonic pelvic floor would be like a fist that can't open. So and obviously neither one is functional. You need to be able to do both. Um, and then a lot of women have a combination of both. They have elements of tension and weakness. And then you have issues like, um, you know, things that happen in, in menopause where there's lax, laxity and instability in, in the pelvic structure. And then there's issues with the hips that can come online and, and you can work with. So yeah, there's yoga poses that you can use to strengthen the pelvic floor. And there are yoga poses that I work on, work with clients on to relax the muscles of the pelvic floor. But it really starts also with using posture and breath to understand what is happening and connect with the pelvic floor to start. So I would say those are sort of the, well, there's really four categories. So using yoga postures and breath to connect with and understand the state of the pelvic floor. If there is a dysfunction, helping a woman either engage through yoga postures and breath the pelvic floor or to relax the pelvic floor through posture and breath and and then maintenance again like in in, in menopause there's there's issues of stability and with through injury there could be issues of, of instability as well so you can work um use use these tools for that as well great Sounds fantastic. Um, you had mentioned a word earlier that I think we should touch on because it's a huge word when it comes to sex, and that's shame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how how does shame place? Why does shame play such a big part in our sexual identity, and how do we deal with it? That's a, that's it's a it's a doesn't it's a tough huge question. I mean, it's just sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, go ahead. There's just a lot to say about. Right. Like, yeah, there's cultural stigma. And, and, and let me just say to thread together what I was just saying with your question, I, I have a lot of clients have come to me because they have like what, what's called vaginismus, let's say, where they, they're, they're the walls of their vagina, their pelvic floor is so tight that, that, that they can't get anything in it. They can't get a good tampon. They can't intercourse. It's painful, you know, et cetera. Um, so so that can, and a lot of that can come from from shame and in, and in, in, in any form of hypertonic can sorry shame can often result in um hypertonic pelvic floor because it's like mm, 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 you know like what's the what's the first thing you do when you're like ashamed it's like oh, you, you constrict so there's that but you know so it comes from religion culture um it can come from sexual assaults, you know, um, shaming out, out in, in culture, out in the field of, of our experience, bad sexual experiences. Um, and, you know, there's also, there's also this element of, of religion too, right? And I think a lot of people who experience shame, there's a religious piece of it. And it's so funny because literally right before I sat with you ladies, my 16 year old said to me, why does religion control things so much, mom? And I was like, I think we're going to be talking about this in a minute. And, you know, and I said to her, I said to her the same thing I'll say here, which is religion, in order to sustain itself and have inherent power, it requires a, set, a steady stream of of shaming, basically, right? Of like requiring abs absolution, right? So what better way than to hook into one of the most natural things that everyone is going to experience, feel, think, and engage in so that I have to come back to the institution and get absolution for what ultimately is completely natural, but through the power of this paradigm, I've put, they've put out there that it's shameful. So it's, this, it's, it's a power building mechanism. How do you overcome shame? Good question. So, <laughs> and I think that's really the, the, how do I say this? The core of my work, the essence of the way I like to work 
with women. And I, I really feel as sort of my, my superpower is really helping women, first of all, discover the truth of their inner experience. There's sort of three steps to this. Discovering the truth of your inner experience, owning the truth of your inner experience, and then ultimately living the truth of your inner experience. Okay. And you need to sort of have all three of those in that order. You can't just live it if you don't first know it. And you can't live it if you don't own it because it's not authentic. Right? So, so through the practices, through all these practices, whether it's physical practice that is like yoga, yogic embodied practices, whether there's journaling, whether it has to do with um, understanding the wider constructs, everything I was explaining about holistic sexuality education in the first place, you begin to normalize your experience after you're able to connect with your experience and you go out in the world and you try to integrate it through all of the tools that I bring to the table. Mm -hmm. So are you living it now in your life? Uh -huh. Well, it's a great question. It's such an excellent question. Also because, right, that, that this is the sixth principle of holistic sexuality education. The fifth and sixth, really. I mean, it begins with the teacher and it's all evolving. So yes, you know, it, yes, and I'm always learning. I'm always finding ways in which, oh God, I, that was, I totally did not just live my truth. And then I have to go back and say, this is what would have been my, the, me living the truth. And next time, hopefully I build on it. And, you know, this is how we evolve. Like, and it's, 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 a, it's also such a great question. Actually, I, this is, this is such an important part. And so I'm really glad you asked it because as a teacher, as an educator, as, as somebody who you know, is out in the, in the public eye teaching women, I, I really feel saying this is so, so, so important because I personally get very triggered and have always by people who come out there and say, I have this all solved. And if you do my program that I, that it was, has been my total, you know, savior and I'm all healed now, you're going to be perfect. It's, I'm not going to promise you that. And I'm certainly not going to say that that's the case for me. I am evolving and I have tools that are helping me. And I, can share them with you. And I believe they will help you as well as, as, as we go through it. Interesting. But without giving, without, you know, divulging any personal details, I mean, give us one small example of what you mean by recognizing that you didn't live to your truth and then saying, okay, I'm going to better it the next time. I mean, is there something that you can share without giving away any pers anything personal? <laughs> It's such a great question as well. <laughs> um, oh, sure. I can hold a bunch of this. Let's see. <laughs> um, <laughs> hmm. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go right and give you like a very sexual one, shall I? <laughs> okay. Sure. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think that out in media and culture and, and, and let's just say media and culture, there is a um, portrayal of what sexuality and having sex is supposed to be like and look like, right? And we've all seen it, whether it's from a soap opera or a movie or what we read about in a book. It's like, oh, you know, the man sees the woman, the woman sees the man and like they rip off their clothes and boom, 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 they're banging and she's like, ah. And it's all over and it's amazing. <laughs> Is that how it works? No. I mean, yeah. you know, look, I'm not saying that you never have like a quickie, like, oh my God, and it's completely right. satisfying, but there's a whole lot that leads up to you being ready for that anyway, right? So uh, to get to, the, to your, the answer to your question, certainly I have had personal experiences where instead of being with the truth of my experience, which would have meant like really want the man to start, I mean, I happen to be a cisgender heterosexual woman, um, where I want the man to come to me very slowly and very softly and begin with barely touching me and, you know, let it progress very slowly. But for whatever is happening, the man is all hot and heavy and he gets in there and, uh, and I'm like, okay, we're doing it, you know, let's, and then I'm not going to be satisfied. And I think that's, okay, I'm not going to say, I think, I know that story is true for many, many women. You're absolutely right there. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's so true. Um, we do have a, a question that was sent in that says, what's the best advice you can give to someone 
who would like to foster a more positive self-identity? Hmm. That's so good. Oh gosh, there's so many. And see, this is interesting. It's an interesting question because again, at the way that I work with people, really, I really like to understand more about the circumstance. Right? This is the, the, the foundation of holistic sexuality education because not everything works for every person. You know, like I might say to one person, start spending a little time walking around your bedroom naked and looking at your, your, your body in the mirror and finding one thing you love about yourself. You know, um, for another person, I might say, spend a little bit of time, whatever your, your schedule calls for. Again, it would depend on the person every day, every week, touching yourself, even starting, you know, touching yourself in parts of your body that you might not think would be sexual, but feeling what it feels like to touch and be touched. Um, start there and, and start getting in touch with that. Um, for some people, it might be spending a little bit of time. I'm, you know, this this I would say to everybody: really have a meditation, reflection, embodied daily practice where you get in touch with your inner experience. And this is what I absolutely want every single client of mine to do: is to spend at least five minutes a day, just sitting, feeling, breathing, body, breath mind hopefully you get to that again that deeper layer of the wisdom right <laughs> and you get you get to these deeper layers of understanding and, and 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 get to the truth of what you feel and then you can begin to strip away things like what doesn't actually resonate with you if that makes sense so you know I, I'm, I'm assuming part of that question might be you want we read it again uh, what's the best advice you can give to someone who would like to foster a more positive self-identity? Yeah, well, there could be a lot of that because it, be, yeah. it could be a sexual orientation identity, a gender identity, it could be any of that stuff. So you might look at um, things that you think about yourself and then start asking, like, well, why do I think that about myself? Is it because it's what my parents told me? Is it what because I learned in my religion? Start looking at, again, those domains of your life. So there's another layer, again. When people go to my website, they'll see it. This is it. So this is that same <laughs> love it. Right? It's the same circle. It's forward or backward? I know it's, it's the right way. Forward, <laughs> forward, yeah. And then, you know, so yeah. this is what I'm talking about, all those domains of, of our lives, right? And it, and it takes, an, it's like a big imprint on who we are. And it's like knowing what's that imprint and knowing what's really us. Yeah. Fantastic. Because I mean, what's I... really, really us is always going to be, is always going to be perfect and, and, and authentic, right? That's. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do love your advice about walking around naked and just finding one thing you like about yourself, because I think we are so negative about ourselves, so readily negative about ourselves that it adds to a really overall this overall negativity about everything, about our lives, about the way we look, about the way we have sex, about the way, you know, everything. So I think, yeah. So just that one little switch to a more positive um, side to, to our identity can really change the whole landscape. Yeah. yeah. It will definitely help with insecurities. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I yeah. love the way that that's what you tapped into also because, you know, one of the things that, that it's real, another reason that I really got into this work is it's really the whole, what I call, it's a big, it's a mouthful, the socioeconomic industrial governmental complex, right? And it all is, it, it's, it all feeds into, if I make you feel broken, ashamed, uh, dirty, you know, I can then sell you something, right? If I, if I create a sense of lacking, in, 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 you know, within you, you're going to come and seek it up. When the antidote to all of that really is, I, I, I'm actually okay <laughs> because I understand what's happening inside of me and what's, in, what's happening inside of me is never wrong. Yeah. Right. So we're like running out of time now, Liz. That was it's quick. No, so quick. It just, it's so weird. Yeah. Forever. forever. I mean, yeah. I just, I love tapping into the fact how we're so manipulated to feel, mm -hmm. to, to, 
think of ourselves as being broken in spite so many different angles, so many different messages coming at us. So that's such yeah. a huge topic, but we, we have to stop. <laughs> Liz, are you on Instagram at all? I am on Instagram. I barely use it, but you know, someone might look at this later and I'm back on it. So you could, you could check it out. It's Liz Ilgen Fritz. Um, but my website uh, links to my Instagram and then my website's just my name. Great. Okay. Um, Great. Good. Well, we'll definitely be looking into you and looking and we'll find you out there. Thanks for the time, ladies. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz. Really appreciate your words of wisdom. You're welcome. I hope it helps anyone who's listening find their inner truth. V Love Hub is produced by Judy DiMello and Ann Katari. We've got lots of great resources listed on our website, vlovehub.com. That's V-L-U-V-H-U-B.com. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your pods.